This morning is the final sermon in the sermon series called Lord Teach Us to Pray on the Lord's Prayer. Next week, for those of you who are going to be here, what we typically do at the end of sermon series is I will do a summary and we'll open up for a time of testimonies. And so uh, during this sermon series, we've also done 21 days of fasting and prayer. And so if you have testimonies from that time of fasting and prayer or from things that you either learned or God put in your heart during the series next week, please come ready to share. It's always an encouragement uh, when people besides me get up here and share what's going on and what God is doing in their lives. So this Sunday, though, is the final sermon in this series. The phrase, Lord, teach us to pray, comes from Luke 11, 1, where it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And I love that because it, evidently there was something about the way Jesus was praying that made his disciples say, I want to learn about the relationship you have with the Father. Teach us to communicate with God the way you do. And so in response, he teaches them what's commonly come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. And we've been using Matthew 6, that version of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to read that for you now. Jesus said this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We're going to be focusing on that last section this morning. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But just to recap again, Jesus says, when you pray, begin with God. Don't begin with yourself. Begin with God. Approach him with a balance of intimacy and reverence, that he is your father in heaven. And so you can come to him with the intimacy of a child to his father or her father, but also with the reverence that this is not just your father, but your father in heaven. And begin with his glory. Hallowed be your name. May you be treated with the glory and honor you deserve. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. May my will be subordinate to your will. What I want, what my needs are subordinate to your will, your kingdom. I give up control to you. So again, he says, before you even get into your needs and wants, begin with God. Properly orient yourself to who he is. And then, he says, get into your needs. Give us today our daily bread. What is it that you need from God today? Forgive us our trespasses, our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Where do you need him to pardon you? What do you need to confess? And as you're reminded of those that you might need to forgive as well. And now, he says, ask for protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, or from evil, depending on the translation you read. And so in order to understand this last section, I want to answer three questions this morning, which are these. Who is the evil one that he's referring to here? How does he tempt us? If we're asking God not to lead us into temptation, well, how does the evil one tempt us? And then finally, how do we fight against temptation? So who is this evil one? How does he tempt us? And how do we fight against this temptation? So the evil one comes by many names in the Bible. Satan, the devil. And a few things to say about this evil one. He's a created spiritual being who rebelled against God and opposes God and his people. He is the enemy, the evil one, the enemy of God, the enemy of his people. Isaiah 14 is a verse, a passage is commonly looked at as one of the allusions to this fall of Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. The devil hates you. The devil hates God. 
and he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy anything and anyone that God loves. And he has many other fallen angels, demons, who want to destroy you in God's plan as well. Peter says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You're going to notice in the passages that I use, there's some strong language used by Jesus and by the disciples to talk about this enemy, right? I mean, in this one, what do you see? That the enemy is like a roaring lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. This is no joke, in, otherwise, in other words, right? This is no joke that there is an enemy, an evil one, who is bent on destroying you, who wants to shipwreck your life and your eternal destination. And nothing will destroy your life quicker than falling into the hands of this evil one. So I would suggest, as it says, you be alert this morning and of sober mind and pay attention to what I have to say and what God's word has to say. Because if you knew there was someone who was whose life mission was to destroy you, you would be wise to pay attention, to be alert, to be of sober mind. So he's a created spiritual being who rebelled against God and opposes God and his people. He's also our adversary who lies, slanders, and deceives in order to separate us from God. He's a liar, a slanderer, a deceiver. Jesus said this. You, he was talking to the Pharisees here. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Are we clear, he says, are we clear that wherever there is lying and deceit and slander, that is coming from the enemy, the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. The word devil in the Greek is diabolos, which means liar slanderer. And the word Satan means adversary, enemy. First shows up in Genesis chapter 3, right, as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. What does he do? He lies. He deceives Eve to disobeying God, eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From the very beginning, he's a liar, a deceiver, doing all that he can to warp your mind, to trick you into leaving God, separating you from God do anything he can to convince you that God is not good, that God does not love you, that he does not know what is best for you. It's what he did in the beginning with Eve. It's what he continues to do today. Anytime that you are convinced that God doesn't know what he's talking about, that his word can't be trusted, that he does not love you, that he is not good, that is the lie of the enemy, the evil one, who's a liar, a deceiver from the very beginning. So he's a created spiritual being who rebelled against God, he opposes God, he's an adversary who lies, slanders, and deceives, and he is the tempter who tries to separate us from God. Matthew 4, verse 3, this is after Jesus went into the wilderness and was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, it said, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The name given there to the evil one is the tempter trying again to tempt you away from God. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, Paul says, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. You can be sure if there is an enemy who was opposed to you that he will do whatever he can to put people, to put situations in your path, to tempt you away from God to try to shipwreck your life and your faith. Again, some more strong words from Jesus. He says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. They're not mixing words, are they? Again, this is Jesus saying, there's the thief, this enemy, this evil one is a thief. He cannot be trusted. He wants to steal. He wants to kill, he wants to destroy, and he will use whatever means necessary to tempt you away from God. And Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it, have it abundantly. The fourth thing we will say about this evil one is this. 
that he is a defeated enemy who will be destroyed in the end. Hallelujah. He is an enemy, but he is a defeated enemy. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus, too, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. By Jesus' death on the cross, and by his resurrection, the enemy has been defeated. He will be destroyed in the end. As it says in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So thankfully, that's the end of the story right there. That's how it all ends. But in the meantime, he's very much alive. He's very much alive and very much doing all he can to slander, to lie, to kill, to destroy, to tempt do everything he can to destroy God's work and pull you away from God. And there's two mistakes we can make when it comes to the enemy, as C.S. Lewis put it. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Right? There's two poles, two extremes that you can fall into. One is to say this whole thing is just superstition and mumbo jumbo and there are no spiritual beings, right? It's just everything that we can see and touch with our own hands. And to the scientific West, yes, the idea of a devil or demons may seem very primitive. I'd say a couple things to that. First of all, most of our people around the world are much more spiritually alert and, and aware than we are, right? Than we are in the scientific West where we think, well, we can just, everything that we can see with our head, you know, with our eyes and touch with our hands is what there is. Most people around the world are much more aware of the spiritual reality. So maybe we shouldn't be so arrogant. And secondly, I would say, despite our attempts to improve the world with education and politics and psychology and all of those things, I don't necessarily see that we are making much progress. Maybe we would be wise to consider that maybe there is a spiritual realm that cannot be improved upon by education and psychology and politics and things like that. that. There is an evil one. There is a realm beyond which we have the ability to cure by our own human efforts. But of course, on the opposite side, some Christians attribute everything to the devil, that everything is because of a demon. And that, of course, would be another error to fall into, that you know, the truth is that some issues we face are physical. Sometimes you need medicine or food or rest. Some things are psychological that sometimes you need love and affirmation and help to deal with things. Some issues are moral. Maybe you're dealing with something because of your own sin that you need to repent and be forgiven. And some things are spiritual. Some things are the result of demonic oppression and you need prayer and deliverance. But again, not everything is of the devil. So that's who the evil one is, that he is a created being who fell from God and has opposed, he opposes God and his people. He is the slanderer, the liar. He is the tempter, but he will be destroyed in the end. So how does he tempt us? There's two classic books on this subject that were helpful to me in understanding. Uh, these are from a few centuries ago. One is called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices by Thomas Brooks. And another one is called The Christian in Complete Armor by William Gurnall. But again, Satan has all kinds of methods and schemes. And James 1, 13 to 15 tells us, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And Satan tempts us and draws us away from God until sin gives birth to death. Remember this verse from Ephesians where Paul said, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. It's a great way of putting it. It makes me shudder, but it's a great way of putting it, right? That there's things that we can do in our sin that give the devil a foothold in our life. One example he gives here is going to bed angry with someone, giving the devil a foothold. But there's plenty of other ways that when we sin, when we decide to go against God, we are giving the devil a foothold in our life. 
So I want to draw upon one of those books, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. He gives a lot of strategies, schemes of Satan that he uses. I'm going to just list seven of them. Again, I'm not going to give the whole book this morning, but here's seven ones that you may notice on how Satan tempts us. The first one Thomas Brooks calls, he presents the bait and hides the hook. Likening Satan to a fisherman there and us to the fish. Present the bait, hide the hook. That Satan is a master of showing the short-term pleasures of things, but hiding the long-term misery, right? Or as theologian Klein Snodgrass put it, evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is a baited and camouflaged trap. Can you think of any examples from your life or the lives of people that you know? The things that you think will feel so good, right? The flirtation that just makes you feel good, the attention you get from other people, the drink, the drugs, the purchases, the yelling, the laziness, the ice cream, the shows, all these things that in the short term just seem so pleasurable until the bait has been pulled away, the hook is in your mouth, and you're captured, and you reap what you've sown, and you experience the long-term pain that came from that short-term pleasure. Second strategy that Satan uses to tell you that God is all mercy and no holiness. Don't worry, go ahead, you can sin, you can do it. God will forgive, that's what he does. God's a forgiving God. You just do whatever it is you feel like doing and God has to forgive. Hiding the fact that God is also holy, hiding the fact there are consequences to sin. A related strategy is number three, telling you that sin is not a big deal and that repentance is easy. Come on, you'll do it, you'll repent, it'll be in the past, God will forgive, nothing, as if nothing happened. Hiding, of course, this truth from Hebrews 3, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. That repentance necessarily isn't necessarily easy, that every time you sin, you are taking a conscious step away from God and hardening your heart towards him. And repentance becomes harder the further you get away. There's a book, uh, What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey, and he talks in there about a conversation he had with a friend who was thinking of leaving his wife for another woman. And the friend was like, well, you know, won't God forgive me for what I'm about to do? And this is what Philip Yancey said in response. He said, can God forgive you? Of course, you know the Bible. God uses murderers and adulterers. For goodness sake, a couple of scoundrels named Peter and Paul led the New Testament church. Forgiveness is our problem, not God's. What we have to go through to commit sin distances us from God. We change in the very act of rebellion, and there is no guarantee we will ever come back. You ask me about forgiveness now, but will you even want it later, especially if it involves repentance? Just read that one again on your own. So that's one of the strategies that Satan uses. Forgiveness is easy. Repentance is easy. Just go and do what you want and God will forgive and repentance will happen. Hiding the fact that sin changes you, that every time you make a conscious step away from God, it changes your heart, it hardens your heart. And will you even want to repent the further you get away? How about this strategy, the fourth one? Tell you that you've suffered enough so you deserve what you want. You know, I worked so hard today pro providing for my family. I deserve this drink. I just served God in this way, and I deserve to just indulge my flesh however I want. I have denied myself for so long. I deserve this. How about this one, number five? convince you that holiness is not worth it. You know, I look out of the world and those people who aren't even following God seem to have better lives than I do. Their lives seem to be so much easier, so much better. 
this whole following God thing is just not worth it. Holiness just doesn't pay off. Or get you to compare one part of your life to another. I pay my taxes. I don't cheat on my wife. I do all these things. So what if I indulge in this one area of my life, you know, and I have this for myself? And the last strategy, convincing you that you don't need God. That you can do it on your own. That you don't need to pray. You don't need to spend time with God. That you can be self-reliant. You have enough talent in yourself to do whatever it is that you need to do. You do not need to depend on him for anything. You do not need to pray. Can I encourage you to let Jesus' prayer here, the Lord's prayer, be a wake-up call to you? You are no match for Satan on your own. There's a reason that Jesus ends his prayer by saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Asking God to deliver us from the evil one because on your own, you are no match for the enemy. Even if you look at your life and you're like, it's not so bad, you know? He's probably got you right where he wants you, right? He's just kind of lulling you to a sense of complacency so that he can devour you. These are just seven of Satan's strategies. But I encourage you to be alert, as it says, self-controlled and sober-minded. So how do we fight against temptation? How do you fight against him? As Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 10, if you think you're standing firm, be careful you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Thank God. First and foremost, that first part of the verse tells you, again, be careful that you're not being lulled into a sense of complacency. You know what? I've overcome my temptations. I don't struggle with that anymore. So be careful. It's another strategy of Satan's right there. But he says, listen, anytime you're tempted, God is faithful to provide you a way out. The most thorough instruction is given in Ephesians 6 by Paul. He says, be finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Notice he tells you to stand, right? And don't go out there and win the victory, but stand in the victory that Jesus has already won for you. Stand in the truth of who God is and what he's done, what he's promised. Be strong in the Lord, not in your own strength. And he says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The belt of truth was like a leather underwear in those, those days, like an apron. It would gather the tunic together and hold the sword to make sure that as they marched, they were unimpeded by their tunic. He says, let the belt of truth be buckled around your waist. Stand on the truth of who God is and what he's done, what he says about you. When you're tempted, remember the truth of who God is and what he has said, that he loves you, that he is for you, that he has come to give you life to the full, that the enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy so you can walk unimpeded. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, the breastplate protects the front, the heart, protects the, back, the front and the back, protects your heart. The breastplate of righteousness, not only the righteousness that God has given you through Jesus Christ, but the righteousness that comes from being in a right relationship with God, walking rightly with him and holiness with him, that that is what will protect your heart from the enemy. That wherever there is unrighteousness, wherever there is sin, that it gives the devil a foothold into your heart. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, standing firm in the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, that you are right with him, that that is the depth of his love for you. Take up the shield of faith 
with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil ones. The faith that comes from believing in the promises of God and believing in who he is so that when the devil comes and tries to tempt you away, you stand in faith in who Jesus is, who God is, what he has said, and what he has promised. You say no. And you hold, it says, the sword, the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation that protects your mind, that you are saved by grace through faith, that you are a beloved child of God, that you belong to him, that you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That is our offensive weapon, the word of God, knowing the Bible, knowing who God is and what he's promised. Think about Jesus in the wilderness. When Satan came, what did he say over and over? It is written, it is written, it is written. That is how he attacked, that is how he defeated the devil, by knowing what was written, by knowing the word of God. That was the sword of the spirit. And then he goes on to say, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Do not think you can do this alone. You cannot defeat the enemy on your own. He is too crafty for you. But always be in prayer at all times, all kinds of prayer, with all perseverance. Never stop in your connection with God. Do not fight these battles alone. You need God and you need each other. All those metaphors about the armor of God, they worked because of the way the soldiers were going into, going into battle together, guarding each other's back. And as it says in James, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This is why we have for example, a Wednesday night group called Fight Club, right? It's a men's group that we chose that name because we fight for each other in whatever battles are going on in our lives, recognizing that we weren't meant to go through this life alone. So again, there is an enemy who wants to destroy you. Take this seriously, please. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one because temptation will shipwreck your life and your faith. And the evil one is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But there is a savior. There's a savior who died for you, who has given you his righteousness, a right relationship with God. He has given you his Holy Spirit, the power of God in you. And so, as it says in James again, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. As the worship team comes forward, Take time between you and the Lord to put this into practice. Submit yourself to him. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's pray. Father, this morning I stand here with my brothers and sisters united against our common enemy. We recognize that the evil one just wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He was a murderer from the beginning. He lies, he deceives. He's doing all he can in his power to pull us away from you, to destroy the good works that you have done, to destroy individuals and marriages and churches and your kingdom, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you've destroyed the power of the enemy by your death on the cross and your resurrection from the dead. And we stand, Lord, in that victory that you've won. We stand against the enemy. We submit ourselves to you, to our good Father. We resist the devil. We resist his temptations. We resist, Lord, his lies, his deceptions. We submit ourselves to your good will for our lives, Lord. We thank you that you promised that when we submit ourselves to you and resist him, that he flees from us. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.